And good evening. You are looking at a live picture of the United States Capitol building here in Washington, where in just about 30 minutes, President Donald J. Trump will deliver his very first State of the Union address. I'm Jordan Frazier coming to you live from Statuary Hall inside the U.S. Capitol building. And I'm Libby Casey. And in just a few moments time, you will see members of Congress. You'll see dignitaries. You'll see members of the president's cabinet walking behind us as they make their way to the House chamber in preparation for this speech. And Jordan, we've already seen some very notable guests we go have. by, including Supreme Court members, uh, the Chief Justice. Mm -hmm. We also saw Justice Neil Gorsuch go by for yeah. his first State of the Union and it's as always, Justice. It's always fun to see the Supreme Court because amazing. there's no cameras. Yeah in the courtroom, so it's unique to see them and on it's TV. Sometimes it's hard to recognize them because exactly. they do not have their black robes on. Right. Uh, we will also see a lot of other guests tonight. Uh, the president and the first lady have a set of guests, and we'll talk about those in just a little while. But Democrats and Republicans are also bringing people who they want to make a statement with. Right. So we're seeing dreamers here. We're seeing members of the military. And it really is like a swath of America to see who's present tonight. Yeah, absolutely. It's an opportunity for members of Congress to make sort of their own political statement as the president kind of brings this big spotlight to Washington and 50 million eyeballs across the country. And if this feels a little familiar to you, that's because President Trump did make an address last year to the joint session of Congress. It wasn't an official State of the Union, though. That's its first time right. tonight. And it's laid out in the Constitution that the president shall from time to time uh, go to Congress, address them, and give them an update on the State of the Union. And of course, in the modern era, we see it on TV. You'll watch it here at WashingtonPost.com. You can also find us on YouTube. Tonight, we'll hear the Democratic response as well. So stay tuned after the speech. We'll hear from uh, Democrat Joe Kennedy. Uh, he is a rising star in the Democratic Party, a House member, and he'll be uh, in his like, you know, home district giving uh, a talk just about what he wants to see in the State of the Union. And a fun moment for us coming up later after the Democratic response. We'll have some senators live here that we'll get to chat with and get their immediate reaction to what the president had to say. So Jordan, you cover Capitol Hill yep. and uh, we are uh, you know, hearing from you all the time. About, oh, we're oh, and the, the vice president. president is coming right behind us right now, joined by Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority leader uh, and the rest of the Republican leadership uh, here on this in the Senate. Corey Gardner, Tim Scott, several of the, the, oh, the rest of the Senate. As well. yeah. And I'm just going to get out of the way here so you can see there are some bipartisan moments because we are seeing some Democrats and Republicans walk together, which is certainly a significant uh, visual optic. Yeah, we, and we expect the president to touch on issues of bipartisanship and working together and seeing Republicans and uh, Democrats right there, walk an into the Republican chamber Democrat here. Walking together, that's right. It's a powerful visual for the country for sure. So the senators have their offices on the other side of the Capitol, so they are walking through Statuary Hall where we're located, a lot of other reporters here and television cameras located uh, as they make their way to the House chamber where the president will give his speech in just a little while tonight. And it's suitable, uh, Libby, we are missing one senator tonight, John McCain at home recovering uh, from a, an injured leg and of course his battle with cancer. Another Democrat, Republican uh, couple, too. And other Democrats, Republicans walking there together. Susan Absolutely. Collins and Maisie Hirono. Uh, Jordan, you've been talking to members on Capitol Hill as they've been preparing for tonight. What are you hearing from them? Absolutely. Just mem many of the members that we just saw walk by here. Uh, and what I asked them was what they hope to hear from the president tonight, as well as how they would assess their own opinion of the State of the Union. Uh, I started by asking Senator Bob Corker uh, and take a look at what he had to tell me. Look, the state of our union is uh, economically, it's, uh, you know, it's very strong right now. Uh, I think people are feeling the animal spirits, if you will, in the business world. But our country is very divided and, uh, you know, it's polarized and, and uh, uh, there's, a lot, there's a lack of trust. And, uh, you know, um, so the, you know, one of the roles of a president is to, to try to bring the country together. Well, look, I think the, uh, the, the real issue that worries me is this issue of division, which is being fomented by the, by the president. And, and, and the president's ability to influence is significant under any circumstances. So you're either going to be a force for bringing people together or a force for dividing. Most presidents at least make an effort, whether, you know, ho however successful they make an effort, to try to bring people together. That's not what this president has chosen to do. Well, I, mean, I think overall, if you look at it from a policy-centric perspective, there's no doubt that we are on strong foot. Footing. I think from a cultural perspective, we have uh, some, some ways to go, and I think that uh, hopefully there will be parts of the presentation tonight that may speak to ways to bring this American family together from a uh, social perspective. I think policy-wise, we're already there. I think from a social perspective, uh, I hope to hear 
on some reforms that perhaps the president is considering that will uh, bring more glue to this American family. Well, you know, I, I think this may sound strange, but it really is sincere. Uh, this president has been the most dishonest and divisive president perhaps in the history of this country. And I think it really would be an extraordinary thing if he did something that I think people would respond very positively to, and that is to apologize. Uh, he lies all of the time, and we cannot have a government run effectively when you have our leader lying all, all the time, and I think he has got to address that issue. And I'm not sure we will hear the president apologize, as That's Bernie really Sanders right, suggested. It is State of the Union night. Anything could happen. We'll see. Uh, but joining us now here in Statuary Hall is our congressional reporter, Ed O'Keefe. Ed, always a pleasure for Good you to, to join you us. Welcome to, to the Capitol. Thanks very much. So, Ed, it, we are seeing bipartisanship already here as we've watched members of the Senate go two by two, yeah. like Noah's Ark, you know, seeing Democrats and Republicans together. Do you expect that mood to prevail throughout the president's speech? Depends on what he has to say. I think, uh, you know, the, the early excerpts suggest there are at least some attempts to reach across the aisle and get the two sides working together, especially on immigration, which is a big concern right now, top of mind uh, for many lawmakers. Uh, but we'll see. You know, I, I, we had a conversation yesterday with uh, Senator Angus King and Shelley Moore Capital at the Post. They were part of a preview, and Senator King was an independent from Maine, but caucuses with the Democrats was joking that sometimes you, you realize you're standing up to applaud for something, and you realize nobody else around you is standing with you. But it's a good sign of independence, perhaps, but uh, also a sign that people pay close attention to this and know that if they're caught applotting for something or booing something, yeah. it could get used against them in a future campaign ad. Yeah, so those campaign all, ads. You gotta all watch of out these guys that. are very sensitive to that and, uh, and Ed, know that there's a large audience tonight. Yeah. Ed, we are just about a week out from the government shutdown. How did that change Congress's relationship with the White House, do you think? With the White House, well, it, it depends on, on who you ask, I suppose. I think both sides are eager to see the president somewhat engaged or to stay totally out of it. And, and, and the problem is that he does a little bit of both. He might weigh in by Twitter, but then not actually offer up some detailed ideas on what exactly should be done. And that's frustrating to members of both parties. Uh, we had an interview over the weekend with Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, who said at this point, if he doesn't want to get involved, fine. Leave it to us here at the Capitol to sort this out amongst ourselves, specifically or more more specifically, the uh, the immigration issue, the spending bill and whatnot, that can get sorted out pretty quickly as well. The White House would have to have input. Um, so we'll see what he says tonight uh, about sort of the issue in front of them. Or if he continues to stay out of it, I think Democrats and Republicans will say, fine, we'll sort this out and we'll send it to you. And we're seeing live images right now from inside the House chamber where so many people are already gathered. You see there those balconies where the guests are, uh, the first ladies boxes. These are um, the fun shots to see people interacting and chatting and getting absolutely. to know each other a little bit more. And they will even be strategic about where they sit tonight exactly. in terms of will the president be able to see them so they can give him their support or register that protest by not standing and applauding. Yeah. And also members of Congress decide if they're going to sit near the aisle so they can shake the president's hand, be caught on camera with him. I mean, you know, Ed, one thing I've been wondering about is how much the Russia investigation and the fallout from that is overshadowing tonight. Obviously, the president would like the country to focus on his opportunity to be presidential, but we're seeing even Republicans make moves right now with the Nunes memo uh, to, to keep creating this as a story. Yeah, and I think there's some concern that he might bring it up somehow tonight. If he were to do that, that could really sour the mood for the evening and potentially even the rest of the year. The last guy that was under the cloud of scandal that brought this up uh, was Richard Nixon when he suggested the one year of Watergate was enough. Well, we know how that ended. Uh, a lot of concern among members of both parties about that memo that was released by the House Intelligence Committee, the White House's decision yesterday not to impose sanctions that were authorized in a law that was passed overwhelmingly last summer against Russia, because they say that by merely passing it, that was deterrent enough. Uh, and then the ongoing concern that the president might try to do something to upend the ongoing investigation. And we saw the deputy director of the FBI right. step down yesterday. Yeah, and that too, uh, obviously a concern as well, even though he had already signaled he was planning to retire. So all of that is on the minds of lawmakers. But it's funny, you talk to them, you say, do people back home care about this? Are they paying attention? They say no, but they will 
if he tries to pull something right. and if we have to quickly react to stop him from doing so. Right. All right, uh, Ed O'Keefe, we know you have more reporting to do. We will let you get back to that and uh, get back to work. Uh, but thanks very much for being with us. Have fun, guys. All right, thanks thank so you. Much, Ed. And you can see the chamber filling up there. Uh, there is Ivanka Trump, her husband Jared Kushner. Um, we also see other members of the president's family. His sons are present. Um, not and Barron. Barron. Not Barron. It Barron's, is a school night. Yeah. Barron's at home, maybe doing a little homework. There is a lot of focus on the First Lady tonight. There is. Uh, because uh, she has not attended a couple of uh, high profile events in recent days. She elected not to go with the president to Davos and then she flew down to Florida right. on her own. Jordan, are you going to be watching her reactions tonight? I think everyone will be watching her reactions tonight, especially, you know, how expressive she is to uh, things her, pre uh, her husband, the president, has to say. Um, and we're also monitoring some protests that are happening just outside the Capitol, just down the street here. Um, this is actually outside the federal courthouse here in Washington, uh, uh, which we've seen w in recent it's developments with the, with the Russia investigation. Um, but yeah, these protesters, I know they're carrying flashlights to try and shine at the president's motorcade as he makes his way here to the Capitol building. And they want to be seen by the media, but they also want to be seen by the president and the motorcade. We've already seen the vice president come in through the building. We saw the motorcade a while ago, and he's already here. Yep, he's here. Um, so did he go by those protesters, and does that really make much of an impact? It's a pretty chilly night, windy night here in Washington, D.C., so we don't expect those crowds to be very large, but it does show an element of the resistance. Also resisting, some Democrats. We we're seeing about a dozen Democrats boycott tonight's speech. Some of them are members of the Congressional Black Caucus who mm -hmm. were offended by President Trump's language in the Oval Office meeting where he talked about African nations right. and countries like Haiti. Um, we are also seeing Democrats bring members as a sign of protest. Absolutely. Notably of those members is John Lewis, civil rights icon, who uh, also uh, skipped the president's inauguration just over a year ago. And it's not just confined to the Congressional Black Caucus. Earl Blumenauer of Oregon is mm -hmm. coming, and there are a handful of others who are staying away. Now, I talked to yesterday Congressman Eric Swalwell, a Democrat of California, who said, I'm going because I don't agree with the president and I want to register my displeasure by being a voice and right. being present in the chamber. So a lot of Democrats are also trying to send messages tonight by being here. We will see some wearing black in support of the Me Too movement, the Time's Up movement. Mm -hmm. um, so watch for that. And you'll also be able to see other optics in the chamber. Donna Brazil told us yesterday at the Washington Post that some members may wear kente cloth or traditional African clothing in order to show support with those African countries and that the president used such offensive language Absolutely. as we talked about. Yeah. And one of the other traditions uh, with the State of the Union is the president usually invites uh, anchors from the TV networks over to the White House uh, for a lunch, a little get together to, uh, to chat. And one of the things he was asked about today that I was really struck by was what he has learned in his first year in office. And he really talked about the difference between being a businessman and being an elected politician and that being an elected politician requires more heart. And I think that I think we'll see that on display from the president tonight, especially when it comes to immigration. I think he's going to have to take He's going to have to take a little bit more heart in how he deals with immigration, especially in this chamber tonight. And I hear a gavel as, we, as we're standing here. This is the House the Speaker Paul Ryan. members of the committee on the part of the House to escort the President of the United States into the chamber. The gentleman from California, Mr. McCarthy. The gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise. The gentlewoman from Washington, Ms. McMorris Rogers. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Stivers. The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Messer. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins. The gentleman from Missouri, the Speaker Mr. of the House, uh, the reading a roll call. And of course, he will be sitting behind the president, as will be the vice president. When a big a, moment for the vice president. Absolutely. Yeah. When there's an opposition power in Congress versus the presidency, uh, as you you know remember when President Obama was making the speech mm -hmm. and you saw Speaker Boehner or Speaker Ryan there, right. they can register their displeasure with things. Uh, uh, but now you will see a unified triumvirate up there. You'll right. see three men who are supportive uh, and who are all on the same page. Now, despite exactly. the fact that they are all the same page politically, we have seen a lot of dysfunction here on Capitol Hill. And right. so one goal Republicans want to see tonight is a unified message and a clear path forward, Jordan. And one of the interesting things uh, over the last couple of weeks, especially coming out of the government shutdown, is this group of anywhere between the number changes, but between 22 and 30 senators who have met in a bipartisan fashion and really sort of formed their own coalition to get things done. And they were largely the reason the government shutdown came to an end. Um, and now they're working on immigration. So we'll see, um, you know, how they react 
react to tonight's events. I want to give you a sense of what to expect tonight. The theme of the speech is building a safe, strong, and proud America. Those words are so positive, Jordan. Absolutely. So we give you the sense the president will be trying to strike an optimistic tone, a, a presidential tone, a lofty tone. And we've seen him take both tacks. Last year's joint address had that mood. Uh, of course, that was right on the tails of his inaugural speech, which talked about American carnage, incredibly dark, right. negative language. A real question that a lot of sources I'm talking to are asking is what happens tomorrow? Absolutely. Does the president tweet something tomorrow morning that completely changes the tone of this night? Well, this news cycle is so short and can change with a tweet at 6 a.m. when the president wakes up. So we'll see. I mean, I think that's up to the president with how much he wants to sell his message. And you mentioned this venue here. You know, we saw last year, last February, when the president addressed a joint session of Congress, he was on teleprompter. The It's a, it's a more respectful, subdued audience than we see when he does these campaign-style rallies out in America. And it's just a different sort of Donald Trump in each of these venues. So I, I expect him to be pretty subdued tonight. Let's talk about the guests that the president and the first lady uh, will be speaking of tonight, because uh, you know, Democrats have even said there are some real American heroes in this group. And so it does give you a sense of what direction and tone the president wants to have. We uh, will see some people who were involved in incredible rescue efforts over the past months, be it floods or fires right. in the U.S. We've had so many natural disasters recently. Absolutely. And then we'll also see a Marine who lost both of his legs and was blind and ended up managing to re-enlist and become the first ever blind double amputee to do so. Um, Jordan, what's standing out to you in the guest list? Yeah, well, I want to highlight the dreamers who are in attendance tonight with members of Congress, because what I think a lot of people don't realize is that these dreamers are on the Hill every single day, talking to senators, no matter they're coming from committee hearings, they're going to votes, they're going to lunch, they're arriving from the gym in the morning, and these dreamers are here. They've That's been here for so months. That's a point. So you're in the halls, yes. it's not just what the TV cameras Absolutely. see. They're, they're everywhere. There's a, there's a big lobbying effort uh, by these dreamers to, to really get answers, because there's so much uncertainty in their lives right now. And Libby, you know, over the course of the afternoon, we've gotten some key tidbits from the White House about what the president plans to say. And one of the things he plans to say in his speech tonight is uh, call this a new American moment, which I think is so interesting because it really contrasts with this Make America Great message that he campaigned on and that is still so so part of his persona. So this new American moment it seems more forward-looking, a little, a little bit more progressive than maybe what he campaigned on. We expect the president to take a victory lap on taxes, and one of the guests he has here tonight is someone who says he will benefit from the tax cut, also owners of a company who say they're passing on the benefits to their workers, but a lot of Democrats are very critical of Absolutely. these tax cuts, obviously, and have questions and criticisms about just how much that will uh, translate into a break for Americans. So you can expect the president to talk about it, but do not expect Democrats to cheer that message right. on. And let's just remember the moment that the president is facing the nation, not just the audience here in the chamber, but the, the larger national audience. He comes to this podium tonight uh, with the lowest approval rating of a president in recent memory at this point in their presidency, yet he also has the lowest unemployment at, of any recent president at this point in their history. So the the president will hit heavy on economic, uh, economic news, positive stock market developments. This tax cut will be a huge legislative accomplishment that he will take a victory round on tonight, I, ex I expect. If we look at the list of accomplishments from last year, the punch list, what was President Trump able to do when he laid out his joint address? The tax cuts were a big one, but he also talked about building a wall. That obviously mm -hmm. has not happened. Much Democrats' happiness, some Republicans' disappointment. He also talked about repealing Obamacare. That has not happened, although Obamacare did take a hit. Although the president will claim he, he's, he, yeah, he as, will as claim that it's a success. Package, yes. Yeah, the, uh, that, that, did, that law did take a hit, and it's being chipped away at. We're seeing pictures now, uh, senior counselor to the president, Kellyanne Conway, as well as press secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Uh, a big Hicks, moment for Mike them. Hope as well, oh, and absolutely. Hope Hicks, you're right. I didn't even see her there. Mm -hmm. uh, a big moment for people who work uh, in the White House. You know, the speech is prepared. Now it's kind of all up to the yeah, boss, right? Right. Right. The hard That's work right. is over. Make sure you have those double teleprompters because the teleprompters have gone out <laughs> right. in the past before. So it is uh, it is always of a concern. And a lot of people are wondering, can President Trump stick to the script? He's proven that he can in the past. Yeah. Um, but will he? Well, will what there I, be any going rogue moments? <laughs> exactly. And what I'm interested in is the president has a habit of calling out people he sees in the audience yeah. or sees around him. So I'll be watching to see if he gives any shout outs to members of his cabinet or members of or Congress in the front like row. Chuck and Nancy. Exactly, I mean, right? Any calls across the aisle to <laughs> Democrats, which could which could shake things up a little bit. Right, so we'll, we should have we'll made a little bingo board with these little like, these little moments. We've all really been wondering who's helping to craft this speech behind right. the scenes. And one message, one name I keep hearing is Stephen Miller. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and there has been concern on, on both sides of the aisle, frankly, about just how influential he would be in the speech writing process. He is a very polarizing figure here on Capitol Hill. Um, we talked to Lindsey Graham uh, extensively during the immigration negotiations before the government shutdown, and he was very clear that Stephen Miller is not serving the president well. He called him out by name. He had very harsh words about Stephen Miller. Um, so we'll see how much of his influence actually comes through and what the president has to say tonight. Corps. And we're seeing uh, part of the diplomatic corps enter the House chamber now. The House chamber is actually just to our left here from where we are in Statuary Hall. And uh, you, can, you may be able to see the photographers behind Libby and I as they're uh, <laughs> photographing people entering the chamber. I think we should also talk about the foreign policy aspect to this speech, right? Because this is big. the world is also watching what the president has to say tonight. And you know, we know he will talk about uh, success when it comes to fighting ISIS overseas, but will he discuss Russia? Will he discuss North Korea? North Korea is going to be in the front lines here of, of the topic of conversation as we see the Olympics start in just a couple of weeks. So I'm interested to see what the president, uh, what kind of tone he strikes to North Korea tonight. And as he talks about ISIS, how much will he focus and dwell on the Middle East? Generally, we've seen some horrible attacks in Afghanistan over the past week, just devastating uh, to people there. Will he talk about that? You know, last year, the president started his joint address by trying to, to call out a healing message to the nation, condemning anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. uh, something that he has been criticized roundly in the last few months for not doing more directly. Once again, you see that shot of the protesters there. In the presidential motorcade, shot, I believe. And it uh, looks like the presidential motorcade going by. So those protesters hoping that their signs and, uh, and sounds are seen and heard by the president of the United States. You know, this is just the political nerd in me, but living in Washington, I never get tired of seeing a motorcade go down the street. It's always, sometimes it causes a little traffic, but it's always a little fun, right? That, that must mean you're a nerd, because most Washingtonians just get frustrated <laughs> by the gridlock. Um, but, it, but it really does show how, how, how close and open this democracy can be when you can have protesters right there close by. Right. And in the chamber tonight, as I was saying earlier, it is the swath of America. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are so many people packed into that chamber this evening who represent this country. Karen Pence taking her seat up in the family uh, box uh, in the upper part of the chamber here. Mm -hmm. That's right, and uh, we'll certainly be watching her as well as other members of uh, uh, the families of the vice president and the president as they react to tonight's speech. Uh, Melania Trump, as we mentioned, is one to watch because of the Wall Street Journal story that mm -hmm. broke a couple of weeks ago, that the allegations that the president uh, had an affair with a porn star shortly after uh, he was married to Melania and their son was born, that there was an alleged payout leading up to the 2016 campaign. And Melania has not been in the public eye since then. No, this and, you know, will be and, her first public appearance. And I, you know, I was on the radio show this morning and someone called in and says, this isn't just about scandal, it's about morals to me. Mm -hmm. And it's about getting a sense of family. And, right. and so it's not just about sort of, sort of watching this unfold. It, it speaks to people in other ways as well. And that's an issue that has kind of dogged the president throughout the campaign, right? Is this issue of uh, morals and especially when it comes to the support of his, uh, uh, his evangelical supporters as well. Me too, time up, time's up are big issues tonight, but uh, do we expect the president to talk about that at all, Jordan? Do we have any sense of if that's on his radar? I don't know. That's one it of the things. It'll, It'll be a surprise. It'll be a surprise for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing we do know that he will talk about is restoring the bonds of trust and making Washington accountable to the American people. Uh, I think that will be a popular message in this chamber and outside this chamber because I don't think that has been accomplished necessarily in the last year, especially coming off the government shutdown. There's probably some work to do there. We have some big deadlines looming. Uh, it certainly does not end tonight because in just about a week, we face another deadline for a government potential government shutdown absolutely and dreamers and immigration issues are rolled into that now uh, but also in March we see the deadline for dreamers absolutely. and for their fate and so uh, tension is is growing on Capitol Hill instead of decreasing usually when we get through one of these budget shutdown fights like last week right. everything calms down a little but I'm still feeling more of a build as people grow increasingly concerned about what's to come absolutely and it really is a click ticking clock because tomorrow morning these members will wake up and they go to their party retreats to uh, huddle with their caucus and kind of think through the coming months as we and let's not also forget it is an election year by the way it is a midterm election year which will be an important uh, part of this conversation but the president will talk to the joint session here and then he will also he and the vice president will uh, travel to West Virginia later this month or later this week uh, to talk to the Republican caucus there one fascinating thing the president is not taking this message on the road in a way that we have seen presidents do traditionally in the past uh, President Obama President George W Bush they typically go on the road and sell this to America. Mr. Speaker, the Chief Justice and Associate Justices of the Supreme Court.
And as we mentioned, this is one of those rare moments where the Supreme Court justices are seen on uh, seen on. Oh, and they TV. do have their robes on now. Forgive me for saying that. Yeah, they, a little uh, wardrobe they, change yeah, a little... after they passed us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, but that really does, you know, when they put on that robe, they enter that position, they enter Absolutely. that space. And we don't expect them to react. We expect them to stay stony-faced and not cheering from this speech. Uh, it, of course, made huge headlines a couple of years ago when we saw one of the justices uh, break that uh, that that facade and, uh, and and look really dismayed when the president talked about Citizens United. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg not in attendance tonight, not necessarily an act of protest. Supreme Court justices sometimes do skip this event, you know? It's a late night. Absolutely, and uh, you know, they, uh, many people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg have a history of not attending. Antonin Scalia also didn't attend many of these uh, these speeches throughout history. And we don't see Samuel Alito there, who was, of course, the justice who seemed to mouth "not true" when President right. Obama was speaking during his uh, one of his addresses a couple of years ago. You know, I want to point out a couple of other things that you might see tonight. Um, some House members are wearing red pins that say "Racy" and or "Resi," and and you may be wondering what that's about. Well, it's in honor of Racy. Taylor, who recently passed away. She was elderly, but Jordan, back in the 1940s, she's an African-American woman who was in Alabama, uh, a young mother. She was abducted by some white men uh, and raped. And Oprah Winfrey has brought attention to this issue. Uh, Alabama Congresswoman Terry Sewell has brought attention to this issue. And so you may see some of those red pins tonight in her honor. Um, the, the men who attacked her were never held accountable. They never got justice. When this moment of Me Too, that's a reflection of both racial issues as well as a uh, woman issue part of history that they want to call attention to. Absolutely. And we, you know, we talked about this with Ed in, uh, a little bit earlier in the program, but we do expect the president to strike a bipartisan message. What I'm really curious to talk with legislators after is if they buy it. Right. You know, we've heard this from the president before. Uh, we saw it famously in the, the cabinet meeting uh, leading up to the immigration deal where he seemed very open to kind of whatever they hash out and working with Democrats and Republicans. And he got a bump from that. He got a bump from that, but it didn't hold up. It kind of it kind of crumbled before him. So I'll be interested to ask the lawmakers uh, that we talk to later uh, if, if, if they believe in the president's message there. And stick around after the speech because we will be hearing the Democratic response and then we'll be checking in with senators uh, to get a sense of their reaction. Actions. You see some members there wearing traditional African clothing, kinte cloth, as we talked about. Uh, that is to support African countries, to support nations like Haiti because of the president's controversial and offensive remarks in the Oval Office a couple weeks ago. Absolutely. It's just so fun to watch these scenes and see people, all, everyone in the same room. Usually, you know, the House stays on this side, the Senate stays on that side. So uh, here and we get to see. And the White House stays uh, up Pennsylvania oh, right, Avenue. Exactly. So everyone's mixing <laughs> Although together. Although I will say, Mike Pence uh, has been up on the Hill pretty regularly lately. He's, well, as a I think, former House member, right, he can he's be comfortable the, yeah, here. absolutely, the congressional whisperer to I try to build some bridges. cast something like eight tie-breaking votes in the Senate that just shows how tense things That's are right. up here on the Hill. Let's talk about the designated survivor, of course, one cabinet member hangs back and is not present tonight, just in case, God forbid, something happens. Yeah. God forbid. So we've got the censor uh, of uh, yeah, who this the Secretary is. of Agriculture, uh, Sonny Perdue. Uh, he is the lucky, unlucky. I don't know what you characterize it, but he's the, he's the winner tonight. That's right. So he won't be here, and it's always a guessing game as to as to who will hang behind. You know, leading up to tonight, there's been a lot of controversy, and uh, uh, you know, I want to mention Bernie Sanders. You see him there in your screen. He's one of the Democrats or Independents who's going to be giving an address after tonight's speech. Not the official Democratic response, but he's giving his own speech, and we're seeing about five of those exactly yeah. uh, members who will be and, and not just not just members of Congress or a, a Virginia a delegate who'll mm -hmm. be giving the Spanish address um, to give a sense of of different Democratic perspectives right exactly and I think that also speaks to the Democratic Party right uh, and they're also working on finding their direction finding the the inclusiveness of their party and really using this moment tonight to highlight that so I want to talk about something it's not and Melania inclusive. Trump here. there's Melania Trump the First Lady of the United States arriving in her box to applause.
see a standing ovation from a lot of members of Congress there. Absolutely. The, in support of the, the first family and the first lady. The first lady, usually uh, not a partisan political uh, person to enter the room here. And we saw she greeted uh, the president's guests there in the box as well. The President's Cabinet. And here we see uh, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, uh, you know, sort of a controversial figure in the in the cabinet as far as his relationship with the president. You know, there's been reporting for almost since day one, yeah. at least in the last six now, months, exactly, yeah, yeah uh, that maybe the president and him don't, you know, have the best of relationships. We also have the Treasury Secretary, though. We saw a number of other cabinet members coming in. There's the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions some shaking hands with members of Congress as they enter. This is a night of unity. This is a night when the president's cabinet stands uh, united with him mm -hmm. and cheers on his priorities, uh, no matter some of the turmoil that's been happening behind the scenes uh, in this administration. And you mentioned the president's priorities, right? Uh, usually the president uses this moment of the State of the Union to roll out some new policy initiatives, some new agenda items. It's unclear exactly how much of that President Trump will do tonight. We know he'll talk a little bit about infrastructure uh, and immigration, but as far as new proposals, uh, I think we'll have to wait and see exactly what he says about that. Energy Secretary right there, uh, Rick Perry, and of course the Education Secretary, Wilbur Ross coming in and taking his seat. And these are really the final people to enter the chamber ahead of the president himself. We saw the motorcade uh, just a little bit ago, uh, so we know he is very close to us here. He may, may be in the building at this point. We'll find out soon. And you, you do get a sense of who his cabinet is. And I, you know, they, it is predominantly white men, yes, although indeed. you do see a little bit of diversity there in Ben Carson and Elaine Chow. Um, but this is the president's A team. This is his mm -hmm. lineup. And as we mentioned earlier, there's some uh, turmoil behind the scenes at the White House. But this is a night when they need to be on the same page and they need to be united. So expect them to stand and cheer and be very supportive of their commander in chief. And you know, some of them has a, have a wish list. They, they want to hear that their department has priorities. Nikki Haley there, of course the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, uh, they want to hear that they're a priority, right? They Absolutely. want to hear that uh, their issue, be it education or, or, uh, or be it uh, health and human services, is something that the president can tout tonight and, uh, and make some goals for in the future. And we know the president, the way he runs the West Wing, is really giving uh, autonomy to his cabinet secretaries and letting them kind of govern their own parts of the executive branch, right? Mm -hmm. You know, one divisive issue tonight, Jordan, uh, one of the House members requested by the Attorney General as well as Capitol Police that they check IDs here tonight for all the guests and that they arrest anyone who did not have uh, legal documentation right. on them. That's Congressman Paul Gossar. That's raised a lot of controversy. Maisie Hirono, a senator from Hawaii, tweeted out that that was disgusting. Um, so even Jeff though... Senator Blake also very quick to condemn that, saying, you know, these, these individuals often have dreamer status, which is uh, a legal protection. Um, so the, the congressman was technically a little wrong in his tweet there. And he was essentially going after guests who will be entering the chamber exactly. tonight as House members. And uh, so even though we may hear a message of unity tonight from President Trump, there's a lot of rumblings here below the surface of concerns about um, you know what happens tomorrow and can any sort of bipartisanship last beyond the hour or so speech tonight. I agree. I really think that is the question tonight is how much leg, how much, how, how long will this last, right? Will this speech go beyond lunchtime tomorrow? <laughs> we don't know yet. We will have to wait and see, that's for sure. Absolutely. You know, the choice of the president not to take uh, this message on the road is an interesting one. And I've heard from Republicans that they're disappointed. They see this as a missed opportunity because the president can lay out a roadmap tonight or talk about priorities or bipartisanship, but then he usually takes it on the road right. to sell it to the American public. You see there Melania Trump And part of that waving. is you want to capitalize on this moment, yeah. right? You want you want this to ha to last beyond uh, beyond just tonight here in this chamber. So we do expect President Trump to be arriving shortly. And this will be one of the most iconic moments where we see uh, the iconic Mr. Speaker uh, in presenting the president here to uh, Paul Ryan and uh, Mike Pence there uh, at the podium.
It is an incredible backdrop. And when you talk about the optics of the presidency, this is one of those nights where the president has every tool at his disposal Absolutely. of what it means to be uh, the powerful leader of, uh, of American government with yeah. all of these uh, spectators watching on, with um, the, the, the sort of the regal setting of the House chamber with the vice president and the speaker of the House right behind you. And so the White House wants to capitalize on this moment right. and ride it as long as they can. Right. Which, coming up after this, will have the Democratic response, which oftentimes struggles to match sort of the pageantry of this moment, this, this stunning scene here uh, that is the height of America. And I can tell you it sounds like from the from the the activity behind us it sounds like the president is just about to arrive in the chamber here uh, the still photographers are a great clue that something is about to happen here I just sort of ducked over there because you can see all the photographers behind us uh, going into high action trying and to here get we that go the doors shot. open I see I see the president there maybe Mr. Speaker, the president of the United States And this, of course, is that screen time we talked about. For many members of the House who have been camped out all day there along the aisle in the House chamber, quick hello with uh, President Trump as he uh, takes to the podium here. An opportunity for them to get images that they can use in campaign ads, they can use later. Uh, of course, not all members are eager for that for that Correct. face time, and they'll instead be thinking very carefully about the optics of when they stand and cheer, when they decide to stay and dissent. Um, Jordan, we will be bringing you this coverage. We'll also be bringing you an uninterrupted speech tonight by President Trump. And catch us in the back end because we'll have analysis and we'll be hearing the Democratic response Absolutely. from Congressman Joe Kennedy. We'll also talk to senators afterwards. They'll come right back here into Statuary Hall. Right after the speech. They come right out this door yeah. right here. And give us a sense where we got a perfect location here. They'll give us a sense of what they think. I want to point out all those members in black. Did yes, you see that, Jordan? I did, yes. A lot of women wearing black there with some accents of color, but um, that black is very intentional to support Something the Me Too movement. Something we've seen from Hollywood as well Absolutely. with the, the Grammy Awards and uh, through award season. That's right. So we'll see if that optic carries in the chamber. I'm still seeing a lot of color. It pops a color right. in people's wardrobe. But well, usually members tend to wear red, white, right. to show up on camera when That's they right. can. That's right. As is standard, President Trump, uh, as is standard for any president, taking his time to get down this aisle to use this moment. He's Treating shaking the Supreme, Supreme Court, Court here. justices right there. And the president will also present a text of the speech to both the vice president and Speaker Ryan to be entered uh, into the congressional record. You saw there Kevin McCarthy, who is in Republican leadership. He's a very important voice right now. Jordan, one thing to watch for tonight, there is a chance that some Democrats may walk out of the chamber. Uh, many people are hoping that won't happen, right. but um, Democratic leadership has said they, they, they have no guarantees right. on that, so we'll be watching course. for that. Kevin right. McCarthy said... That would be very disappointing, right. um, but we'll be watching to see who stays in the chamber tonight. And now we will toss it over to the President of the United States for his State of the Union. Welcome.
Members of Congress, I have the high privilege and the distinct honor of, pre of presenting to you the President of the United States. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Vice President, members of Congress, the First Lady of the United States, and my fellow Americans, less than one year has passed since I first stood at this podium in this majestic chamber to speak on behalf of the American people and to address their concerns, their hopes, and their dreams. That night, our new administration had already taken very swift action. A new tide of optimism was already sweeping across our land. Each day since, we have gone forward with a clear vision and a righteous mission to make America great again for all Americans. Over the last year, we have made incredible progress and achieved extraordinary success. We have faced challenges we expected and others we could never have imagined. We have shared in the heights of victory and the pains of hardship. We have endured floods and fires and storms. But through it all, we have seen the beauty of America's soul and the steel in America's spine. Each test has forged new American heroes to remind us who we are and show us what we can be. We saw the volunteers of the Cajun Navy racing to the rescue with their fishing boats to save people in the aftermath of a totally devastating hurricane. We saw strangers shielding strangers from a hail of gunfire on the Las Vegas Strip. We heard tales of Americans like Coast Guard Petty Officer Ashley Leppard, who is here tonight in the gallery with Melania. Ashley was aboard one of the first helicopters on the scene in Houston during the Hurricane Harvey. Through 18 hours of wind and rain, Ashley braved live power lines and deep water to help save more than 40 lives. Ashley, we all thank you. Thank you very much. We heard about Americans like firefighter David Dahlberg. He's here with us also. David faced down walls of flame to rescue almost 60 children trapped at a California summer camp threatened by those devastating wildfires. To everyone still recovering in Texas, Florida, Louisiana, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands, everywhere, we are with you. We love you, and we always will pull through together, always.
Thank you to David and the brave people of California. Thank you very much, David. Great job. Some trials over the past year touched this chamber very personally. With us tonight is one of the toughest people ever to serve in this House, a guy who took a bullet, almost died, and was back to work three and a half months later, the legend from Louisiana, Congressman <laughs> Steve Scalise. I think they like you, Steve. <laughs> We're incredibly grateful for the heroic efforts of the Capitol Police officers, the Alexandria Police, and the doctors, nurses, and paramedics who saved his life and the lives of many others, some in this room. In the aftermath, yes. In the aftermath of that terrible shooting, we came together, not as Republicans or Democrats, but as representatives of the people. But it is not enough to come together only in times of tragedy. Tonight, I call upon all of us to set aside our differences, to seek out common ground, and to summon the unity we need to deliver for the people. This is really the key. These are the people we were elected to serve. Thank you. Over the last year, the world has seen what we always knew that no people on Earth are so fearless or daring or determined as Americans. If there is a mountain, we climb it. If there's a frontier, we cross it. If there's a challenge, we tame it. If there's an opportunity, we seize it. So let's begin tonight by recognizing that the state of our union is strong because our people are strong. And together, we are building a safe, strong, and proud America. Since the election, we have created 2.4 million new jobs, including — including 200,000 new jobs in manufacturing alone. Tremendous numbers. After years and years of wage stagnation, we are finally seeing rising wages. <laughs> Unemployment claims have hit a 45-year low. And something I'm very proud of, African-American unemployment stands at the lowest rate ever recorded. Hey! 
and Hispanic American unemployment has also reached the lowest levels in history. Small business confidence is at an all-time high. The stock market has smashed one record after another, gaining $8 trillion and more in value in just this short period of time. The great news — the great news for Americans, 401K, retirement, pension, and college savings accounts have gone through the roof. And just as I promised the American people from this podium 11 months ago, we enacted the biggest tax cuts and reforms in American history. Our massive tax cuts provide tremendous relief for the middle class and small business to lower tax rates for hardworking Americans. We nearly doubled the standard deduction for everyone. Now, the first $24,000 earned by a married couple is completely tax-free. We also doubled the child tax credit. A typical family of four making $75,000 will see their tax bill reduced by $2,000, slashing their tax bill in half. In April, this will be the last time you will ever file under the old and very broken system, and millions of Americans will have more take-home pay starting next month. A lot more. We eliminated an especially cruel tax that fell mostly on Americans, making less than $50,000 a year, forcing them to pay tremendous penalties simply because they couldn't afford government-ordered health plans. We repealed the core of the disastrous Obamacare. The individual mandate is now gone. Thank you. We slashed the business tax rate from 35 percent all the way down to 21 percent so American companies can compete and win against anyone else anywhere in the world. These changes alone are estimated to increase average family income by more than $4,000 a lot of money. Small businesses have also received a massive tax cut and can now deduct 20 percent of their business income. Here tonight are Steve Staub and Sandy Keplinger of Staub Manufacturing, a small, beautiful business in Ohio. They've just finished the best year in their 20-year history.
Because of tax reform, they are handing out raises, hiring an additional 14 people, and expanding into the building next door. Good feeling. One of Staub's employees, Corey Adams, is also with us tonight. Corey is an all-American worker. He supported himself through high school, lost his job during the 2008 recession, and was later hired by Staub, where he trained to become a welder. Like many hardworking Americans, Corey plans to invest his tax cut raise into his new home and his two daughters' education. Corey, please stand. And he's a great welder. <laughs> I was told that by the man that owns that company that's doing so well. So congratulations, Corey. Since we passed tax cuts, roughly 3 million workers have already gotten tax cut bonuses, many of them thousands and thousands of dollars per worker. And it's getting more every month, every week. Apple has just announced it plans to invest a total of $350 billion in America and hire another 20,000 workers. And just a little while ago, ExxonMobil announced a $50 billion investment in the United States. Just a little while. This, in fact, is our new American moment. There has never been a better time to start living the American dream. So to every citizen watching at home tonight, no matter where you've been or where you've come from, this is your time. If you work hard, if you believe in yourself, if you believe in America, then you can dream anything. You can be anything. And together, we can achieve absolutely anything. Tonight, I want to talk about what kind of future we're going to have and what kind of a nation we're going to be. All of us together as one team, one people, and one American family can do anything. We all share the same home, the same heart, the same destiny, and the same great American flag. Together, we are rediscovering the American way. In America, we know that faith and family, not government and bureaucracy, are the center of American life. The motto is, In God We Trust. And we celebrate our police, our military, and our amazing veterans as heroes who deserve our total and unwavering support.
here tonight is Preston Sharp, a 12-year-old boy from Redding, California, who noticed that veterans' graves were not marked with flags on Veterans Day. He decided all by himself to change that and started a movement that has now placed 40,000 flags at the graves of our great heroes. Preston, a job well done. Young patriots like Preston teach all of us about our civic duty as Americans. And I met Preston a little while ago, and he is something very special that I can tell you. Great future. Thank you very much for all you've done, Preston. Thank you very much. <laughs> Preston's reverence for those who have served our nation reminds us of why we salute our flag, why we put our hands on our hearts for the Pledge of Allegiance, and why we proudly stand for the National Anthem. Americans love their country, and they deserve a government that shows them the same love and loyalty in return. For the last year, we have sought to restore the bonds of trust between our citizens and their government. Working with the Senate, we are appointing judges who will interpret the Constitution as written, including a great new Supreme Court justice and more circuit court judges than any new administration in the history of our country. We are totally defending our Second Amendment and have taken historic actions to protect religious liberty. And we are serving our brave veterans, including giving our veterans choice in their health care decisions. Last year, Congress also passed, and I signed, the landmark VA Accountability Act. Since its passage, my administration has already removed more than 1,500 VA employees who failed to give our veterans the care they deserve. And we are hiring talented people who love our vets as much as we do. And I will not stop until our veterans are properly taken care of, which has been my promise to them from the very beginning of this great journey. All Americans deserve 
accountability, and respect. And that's what we are giving to our wonderful heroes, our veterans. Thank you. So tonight, I call on Congress to empower every Cabinet Secretary with the authority to reward good workers and to remove Federal employees who undermine the public trust or fail the American people. In our drive to make Washington accountable, we have eliminated more regulations in our first year than any administration in the history of our country. We have ended the war on American energy, and we have ended the war on beautiful, clean coal. We are now very proudly an exporter of energy to the world. In Detroit, I halted government mandates that crippled America's great, beautiful auto workers so that we can get Motor City revving its engines again. And that's what's happening. Many car companies are now building and expanding plants in the United States, something we haven't seen for decades. Chrysler is moving a major plant from Mexico to Michigan. Toyota and Mazda are opening up a plant in Alabama, a big one. And we haven't seen this in a long time. It's all coming back. Very soon, auto plants and other plants will be opening up all over our country. This is all news Americans are totally unaccustomed to hearing. For many years, companies and jobs were only leaving us. But now, they are roaring back. They're coming back. They want to be where the action is. They want to be in the United States of America. That's where they want to be. Exciting progress is happening every single day to speed access to breakthrough cures and affordable generic drugs. Last year, the FDA approved more new and generic drugs and medical devices than ever before in our country's history. We also believe that patients with terminal conditions and terminal illness should have access to experimental treatment immediately that could potentially save their lives. People who are terminally ill should not have to go from country to country to seek a cure. I want to give them a chance right here at home 
It's time for Congress to give these wonderful, incredible Americans the right to try. One of my greatest priorities is to reduce the price of prescription drugs. In many other countries, these drugs cost far less than what we pay in the United States, and it's very, very unfair. That is why I have directed my administration to make fixing the injustice of high drug prices one of my top priorities for the year. And prices will come down substantially. Watch. <laughs> America has also finally turned the page on decades of unfair trade deals that sacrificed our prosperity and shipped away our companies, our jobs, and our wealth. Our nation has lost its wealth, but we're getting it back so fast. The era of economic surrender is totally over. From now on, we expect trading relationships to be fair and, very importantly, reciprocal. to fix bad trade deals and negotiate new ones. And they'll be good ones, but they'll be fair. And we will protect American workers and American intellectual property through strong enforcement of our trade rules. As we rebuild our industries, it is also time to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure. America is a nation of builders. We built the Empire State Building in just one year. Isn't it a disgrace that it can now take 10 years just to get a minor permit approved for the building of a simple road. I am asking both parties to come together to give us safe, fast, reliable, and modern infrastructure that our economy needs and our people deserve. Tonight, I'm calling on Congress to produce a bill that generates at least $1.5 trillion for the new infrastructure investment that our country so desperately needs. Every federal dollar should be leveraged by partnering with state and local governments and, where appropriate, tapping into private sector investment to permanently fix the infrastructure deficit, and we can do it. Any bill must also streamline the permitting and approval process, getting it down to no more than two years 
and perhaps even one. Together, we can reclaim our great building heritage. We will build gleaming new roads, bridges, highways, railways, and waterways all across our land. And we will do it with American heart, and American hands, and American grit. We want every American to know the dignity of a hard day's work. We want every child to be safe in their home at night. And we want every citizen to be proud of this land that we all love so much. We can lift our citizens from welfare to work, from dependence to independence, and from poverty to prosperity. As As tax cuts create new jobs, let's invest in workforce development and let's invest in job training, which we need so badly. Let's open great vocational schools so our future workers can learn a craft and realize their full potential. And let's support working families by supporting paid family leave. As America regains its strength, opportunity must be extended to all citizens. That is why this year we will embark on reforming our prisons to help former inmates who have served their time get a second chance at life. Struggling communities, especially immigrant communities, will also be helped by immigration policies that focus on the best interests of American workers and American families. For decades, open borders have allowed drugs and gangs to pour into our most vulnerable communities. They've allowed millions of low-wage workers to compete for jobs and wages against the poorest Americans. Most tragically, they have caused the loss of many innocent lives. Here tonight are two fathers and two mothers, Evelyn Rodriguez, Freddie Cuevas, Elizabeth Alvarado, and Robert Mickens. Their two teenage daughters, Kayla Cuevas and Nisa Mickens, were close friends on Long Island. But in September, 2016, on the eve of Nisa's 16th birthday, such a happy time it should have been, neither of them came home. These two precious girls were brutally murdered while walking together in their hometown. Six members of the savage MS-13 gang have been charged with Kayla and Nisa's murders. Many of these gang members took advantage of glaring loopholes in our laws to enter the country as illegal, unaccompanied, alien minors and wound up in Kayla and Nisa's high school. Evelyn, Elizabeth, Freddie, and Robert, tonight everyone in this chamber is praying for you. Everyone in America is grieving for you. Please stand. Thank you very much.
want you to know that 320 million hearts are right now breaking for you. We love you. Thank you. Well, we cannot imagine the depths of that kind of sorrow. We can make sure that other families never have to endure this kind of pain. Tonight, I am calling on Congress to finally close the deadly loopholes that have allowed MS-13 and other criminal gangs to break into our country. We have proposed new legislation that will fix our immigration laws and support our ICE and Border Patrol agents. These are great people. These are great, great people that work so hard in the midst of such danger so that this can never happen again. The United States is a compassionate nation. We are proud that we do more than any other country anywhere in the world to help the needy, the struggling, and the underprivileged all over the world. But as President of the United States, my highest loyalty, my greatest compassion, my constant concern is for America's children, America's struggling workers, and America's forgotten communities. I want our youth to grow up, to achieve great things. I want our poor to have their chance to rise. So tonight, I am extending an open hand to work with members of both parties, Democrats and Republicans, to protect our citizens of every background, color, religion, and creed. My duty and the sacred duty of every elected official in this chamber is to defend Americans, to protect their safety, their families, their communities, and their right to the American dream, because Americans are dreamers, too. Here tonight is one leader in the effort to defend our country, Homeland Security Investigation Special Agent Celestino Martinez. He goes by DJ and CJ. He said, call me either one. So we'll call you CJ. Sir, 15 years in the Air Force before becoming an ICE agent and spending the last 15 years fighting gang violence and getting dangerous criminals off of our streets. Tough job. At one point, MS-13 leaders ordered CJ's murder, and they wanted it to happen quickly. But he did not cave to threats or to fear. Last May, he commanded an operation to track down gang members on Long Island. His team has arrested nearly 400, including more than 220, MS-13 gang members. And I have to tell you what the Border Patrol and ICE have done. We have sent thousands and thousands and thousands of MS-13 horrible people out of this country or into our prisons. So I just want to congratulate you, CJ. You're a brave guy. Thank you very much. And I asked C.J., what's the secret? He said, we're just tougher than they are. And I like that answer.
Now let's get Congress to send you and all of the people in this great chamber have to do it. We have no choice. CJ, we're going to send you reinforcements, and we're going to send them to you quickly. It's what you need. Over the next few weeks, the House and Senate will be voting on an immigration reform package. In recent months, my administration has met extensively with both Democrats and Republicans to craft a bipartisan approach to immigration reform. Based on these discussions, we presented Congress with a detailed proposal that should be supported by both parties as a fair compromise, one where nobody gets everything they want, but where our country gets the critical reforms it needs and must have. Here are the four pillars of our plan. The first pillar of our framework generously offers a path to citizenship for 1.8 million illegal immigrants who were brought here by their parents at a young age. That covers almost three times more people than the previous administration covered. Under our plan, those who meet education and work requirements and show good moral character will be able to become full citizens of the United States over a 12-year period. The second pillar fully secures the border. That means building a great wall on the southern border, and it means hiring more heroes like CJ to keep our communities safe. <laughs> Crucially, our plan closes the terrible loopholes exploited by criminals and terrorists to enter our country. And it finally ends the horrible and dangerous practice of catch and release. The third pillar ends the Visa Lottery, a program that randomly hands out green cards without any regard for skill, merit, or the safety of American people. It's time to begin moving toward a merit-based immigration system. One that admits people who are skilled, who want to work, who will contribute to our society, and who will love and respect our country. The fourth and final pillar protects the nuclear family by ending chain migration. <laughs> Under the current broken system, a single immigrant can bring in virtually unlimited numbers of distant relatives. Under our plan, we focus on the immediate family by limiting sponsorships to spouses and minor children.
This vital reform is necessary not just for our economy, but for our security and for the future of America. In recent weeks, two terrorist attacks in New York were made possible by the visa lottery and chain migration. In the age of terrorism, these programs present risks we can just no longer afford. It's time to reform. these outdated immigration rules and finally bring our immigration system into the 21st century. These four pillars represent a down-the-middle compromise and one that will create a safe, modern, and lawful immigration system. For over 30 years, Washington has tried and failed to solve this problem. This Congress can be the one that finally makes it happen. Most importantly, these four pillars will produce legislation that fulfills my ironclad pledge to sign a bill that puts America first. So let's come together, set politics aside, and finally get the job done. These reforms will also support our response to the terrible crisis of opioid and drug addiction. Never before has it been like it is now. It is terrible. We have to do something about it. In 2016, we lost 64,000 Americans to drug overdoses, 174 deaths per day, seven per hour. We must get much tougher on drug dealers and pushers if we are going to succeed in stopping this scourge. My administration is committed to fighting the drug epidemic and helping get treatment for those in need for those who have been so terribly hurt. The struggle will be long, and it will be difficult. But as Americans always do, in the end, we will succeed. We will prevail. As we have seen tonight, the most difficult challenges bring out the best in America. We see a vivid expression of this truth in the story of the Holetz family of New Mexico. Ryan Holetz is 27 years old, an officer with the Albuquerque Police Department. He's here tonight with his wife, Rebecca. Thank you, Ryan. Last year, Ryan was on duty when he saw a pregnant, homeless woman preparing to inject heroin. When Ryan told her she was going to harm her unborn child, she began to weep. She told him she didn't know where to turn, but badly wanted a safe home for her baby. In that moment, Ryan said he felt God speak to him. You will do it, because you can. He heard those words. He took out a picture of his wife 
and their four kids. Then he went home to tell his wife, Rebecca. In an instant, she agreed to adopt. The Holettes named their new daughter, Hope. Ryan and Rebecca, you embody the goodness of our nation. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan and Rebecca. As we rebuild America's strength and confidence at home, we are also restoring our strength and standing abroad. Around the world, we face rogue regimes, terrorist groups, and rivals like China and Russia that challenge our interests, our economy, and our values. In confronting these horrible dangers, we know that weakness is the surest path to conflict, and unmatched power is the surest means to our true and great defense. For this reason, I am asking Congress to end the dangerous defense sequester and fully fund our great military. As part of our defense, we must modernize and rebuild our nuclear arsenal, hopefully never having to use it, but making it so strong and so powerful that it will deter any acts of aggression by any other nation or anyone else. Perhaps someday in the future, there will be a magical moment when the countries of the world will get together to eliminate their nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, we are not there yet, sadly. Last year, I also pledged that we would work with our allies to extinguish ISIS from the face of the Earth. One year later, I am proud to report that the coalition to defeat ISIS has liberated very close to 100 percent of the territory just recently held by these killers in Iraq and in Syria and in other locations as well. But there is much more work to be done. We will continue our fight until ISIS is defeated. Army Staff Sergeant Justin Peck is here tonight. Near Raqqa, last November, Justin and his comrade, Chief Petty Officer Kenton Stacy, were on a mission to clear buildings that ISIS had rigged with explosive so that civilians could return to that city, hopefully soon and hopefully safely. Clearing the second floor of a vital hospital, Kenton Stacy was severely wounded by an explosion. Immediately, Justin bounded into the booby-trapped and unbelievably dangerous and unsafe building and found Kenton but in very, very bad shape. 
He applied pressure to the wound and inserted a tube to reopen an airway. He then performed CPR for 20 straight minutes during the ground transport and maintained artificial respiration through two and a half hours and through emergency surgery. Kenton Stacy would have died if it were not for Justin's selfless love for his fellow warrior. Tonight, Kenton is recovering in Texas. Raqqa is liberated, and Justin is wearing his new Bronze Star with a V for valor. Staff Sergeant Heck, all of America salutes you. Terrorists who do things like place bombs in civilian hospitals are evil. When possible, we have no choice but to annihilate them. When necessary, we must be able to detain and question them. But we must be clear, terrorists are not merely criminals. They are unlawful enemy combatants. And when captured overseas, they should be treated like the terrorists they are. In the past, we have foolishly released hundreds and hundreds of dangerous territories, only to meet them again on the battlefield, including the ISIS leader, al-Baghdadi, who we captured, who we had, who we released. So today, I'm keeping another promise. I just signed, prior to walking in, an order directing Secretary Mattis, who is doing a great job. Thank you. To re-examine our military detention policy and to keep open the detention facilities in Guantanamo Bay. Yeah. I am asking Congress to ensure that in the fight against ISIS and Al-Qaeda, we continue to have all necessary power to detain terrorists wherever we chase them down, wherever we find them. And in many cases, for them, it will now be Guantanamo Bay. At the same time, as of a few months ago, our warriors in Afghanistan have new rules of engagement. <laughs> Along with their heroic Afghan partners, our military is no longer undermined by artificial timelines, and we no longer tell our enemies our plans.
Last month, I also took an action endorsed unanimously by the U.S. Senate just months before. I recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Shortly afterwards, dozens of countries voted in the United Nations General Assembly against America's sovereign right to make this decision. In 2016, American taxpayers generously sent those same countries more than $20 billion in aid. That is why tonight I am asking Congress to pass legislation to help ensure American foreign assistance dollars always serve American interests and only go to friends of America, not enemies of America. As we strengthen friendships all around the world, we are also restoring clarity about our adversaries. When the people of Iran rose up against the crimes of their corrupt dictatorship, I did not stay silent. America stands with the people of Iran in their courageous struggle for freedom. asking Congress to address the fundamental flaws in the terrible Iran nuclear deal. My administration has also imposed tough sanctions on the communist and socialist dictatorships in Cuba and Venezuela. But no regime has oppressed its own citizens more totally or brutally than the cruel dictatorship in North Korea. North Korea's reckless pursuit of nuclear missiles could very soon threaten our homeland. We are waging a campaign of maximum pressure to prevent that from ever happening. Past experience has taught us that complacency and concessions only invite aggression and provocation. I will not repeat the mistakes of past administrations that got us into this very dangerous position. We need only look at the depraved character of the North Korean regime to understand the nature of the nuclear threat it could pose to America, and to our allies. Otto Warmbier was a hardworking student at the University of Virginia, and a great student he was. On his way to study abroad in Asia, Otto joined a tour to North Korea. At its conclusion, this wonderful young man was arrested and charged with crimes against the state. After a shameful trial, the dictatorship sentenced Otto to 15 years of hard labor before returning him to America last June, horribly injured and on the verge of death. He passed away just days after his return. Otto's wonderful parents Fred and Cindy Warmbier are here with us tonight, along with Otto's brother and sister, Austin and Greta. Please.
incredible people. You are powerful witnesses to a menace that threatens our world, and your strength truly inspires us all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tonight, we pledge to honor Otto's memory with total American resolve. Thank you. Finally, we are joined by one more witness to the ominous nature of this regime. His name is Mr. Ji Sung Ho. In 1996, Sung Ho was a starving boy in North Korea. One day, he tried to steal coal from a railroad car to barter for a few scraps of food, which were very hard to get. In the process, he passed out on the train tracks, exhausted from hunger. He woke up as a train ran over his limbs. He then endured multiple amputations without anything to dull the pain or the hurt. His brother and sister gave what little food they had to help him recover and ate dirt themselves, permanently stunting their own growth. Later, he was tortured by North Korean authorities after returning from a brief visit to China. His tormentors wanted to know if he'd met any Christians. He had, and he resolved after that to be free. Sung Ho traveled thousands of miles on crutches all across China and Southeast Asia to freedom. Most of his family followed. His father was caught trying to escape and was tortured to death. Today, he lives in Seoul, where he rescues other defectors and broadcasts into North Korea what the regime fears most, the truth. Today, he has a new leg. But, Sung Ho, I understand you still keep those old crutches as a reminder of how far you've come. Your great sacrifice is an inspiration to us all. Please, thank you. Sung Ho's story is a testament to the yearning of every human soul to live in freedom. It was that same yearning for freedom that nearly 250 years ago gave birth to a special place called America. It was a small cluster of colonies caught between a great ocean and a vast wilderness. It was home to an incredible people with a revolutionary idea that they could rule themselves, that they could chart their own destiny, and that, together, they could light up the entire world. That is what our country has always been about. That is what Americans have always stood for, always strived for, and always done. Atop the dome of this capital stands the Statue of Freedom. 
She stands tall and dignified among the monuments to our ancestors who fought and lived and died to protect her. Monuments to Washington and Jefferson and Lincoln and King. Memorials to the heroes of Yorktown and Saratoga. To young Americans who shed their blood on the shores of Normandy and the fields beyond. And others who went down in the waters of the Pacific and the skies all over Asia. And freedom stands tall over one more monument, this one, this capital, this living monument. This is the monument to the American people. We're a people whose heroes live not only in the past, but all around us, defending hope, pride, and defending the American way. They work in every trade. They sacrifice to raise a family. They care for our children at home. They defend our flag abroad. And they are strong moms and brave kids. They are firefighters and police officers and border agents, medics and Marines. But above all else, they are Americans. And this capital, this city, this nation belongs entirely to them. Our task is to respect them, to listen to them, to serve them, to protect them, and to always be worthy of them. Americans fill the world with art and music. They push the bounds of science and discovery, and they forever remind us of what we should never ever forget. The people dreamed this country. The people built this country. And it's the people who are making America great again. Yeah. As long as we are proud of who we are and what we are fighting for, there is nothing we cannot achieve. As long as we have confidence in our values, faith in our citizens, and trust in our God, we will never fail. Our families will thrive. Our people will prosper. And our nation will forever be safe and strong and proud and mighty and free. Thank you, and God bless America. Good night.
And with that, President Trump finishes his very first State of the Union address, speaking for about an hour and 20 minutes, the longest State of the Union address since the year 2000, when Bill Clinton addressed a joint session of Congress. The president we saw often clapping along with applause in the chamber. We heard him tick through his first year in office, touting economic success, hitting on themes of patriotism, and hinting at bipartisanship. We also saw that emotional moment with the parents of Otto Wambier. And now as uh, we see the president here making his way out of the chamber, Libby, I'll turn to you. What were your initial reactions to what the president had to say tonight? We always wait for the president to say the words, the State of the Union is strong, Jordan. And President Trump tonight said the State of the Union is strong because our people are strong. He really focused on the American story, American heroes. We saw that reflected in the guests who we introduced from the chamber. And this wasn't a focus on President Trump. Right. He, he often turns the, the, the camera onto himself. He really tried to push it to what makes America strong, um, talking about working hard, believing in yourself. You know, Americans can achieve anything. So there were these very soaring uh, notions of what it means to be an American. However, there were a lot of calls to exactly what his base wants to hear and what Republicans are proud of in this administration. You see him there with Neil Gorsuch, the most recent Supreme Court justice, someone who President Trump gave a shout out to. You saw Justice Gorsuch's stony face not reacting as he was named as an accomplishment of this administration. The president talking about appointing judges who follow the Constitution. That's coded language for conservative judges who. Which is a reason so many people voted for the president. Absolutely. At the end of the day. Even if they had concerns about his own moral character and his own personal background. We heard call outs to the Second Amendment and religious liberty and uh, proudly standing during the national anthem. No small uh, mention of that, of course, As because of the controversy. Absolutely, Jordan. So you did hear him hitting the base issues. We also heard a lot of topics come up that are very important to this administration. Absolutely. And I, I totally agree. When he started out, you know, it was a tough year for many people in this country between the hurricanes, the wildfires. Uh, so many elements, and the president, I think, rightly uh, at the top of the speech, uh, reflected on wh why that uh, m does make America a strong union. But then he pivoted to his priorities and then talked about immigration. And we heard him lay out a very concrete plan, something we expected uh, the White House to do. But this is a controversial plan because as he talks about finding a pathway to citizenship for dreamers, he's also talking about the border wall and he's speaking about changing the entire way that immigrants are brought into this country, changing Absolutely. up the visa lottery system and making it more merit-based. Democrats do not like that. He also used that phrase chain migration, another way of saying family migration. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, it'll, it'll strengthen the nuclear your family. Well, Democrats are loath to that idea because that means not bringing in anyone else who you're related to, something that has long been a tradition in this country. The president ticked through those as his four pillars on immigration and covering Capitol Hill, I can imagine we're going to take each of those pillars one by one right. in the coming weeks. I doubt Congress will be able to tackle all four at, at once uh, now that I, you know, knowing how this body works. Let's hit some other highlights. He plans to keep Guantanamo Bay prison open. That goes in uh, direct contradiction to what we saw President Obama try to exactly. do by the end of his term. And let's run through some numbers. The Washington Post reporting tonight that there are still 41 prisoners there. Uh, more than 700 people held uh, in the past decade and a half, but only a few of them have been charged. Even fewer have been tried. And we not only heard that we're going to keep Gitmo open, but that it, it sounds like the president indicated he may be sending more people there. Yeah, it seemed like he wanted some congressional input on that, but definitely opened the door to that possibility, I think. Uh, one of the interesting things that stuck out with me, especially uh, in the D.C. area here, uh, when the president mentioned MS-13 uh, gang members as part of uh, his immigration part of this speech, which was huge in the Virginia election where we saw a Democrat victorious. So we'll see how that plays uh, in the 2018 midterm. One of the more liberal proposals is paid family leave, something that his daughter Ivanka Trump has been talking a lot about, but the White House certainly has not made a lot of motion on. Um, and so we'll see if that comes to fruition. I do want to mention that just about five Five minutes after uh, President Trump leaves the chamber, we'll 
be turning to the Democratic response. Congressman Joe Kennedy of Massachusetts uh, will be addressing the cameras from a Votech high school in Falls River, Massachusetts. We'll bring that to you live. So stick around even after the president leaves the chamber and things start to thin out uh, in that House chamber. We'll also be talking to senators afterwards to get their reactions, both Democrats and Republicans. What kind of a grade do they give the president's speech and what are their expectations for success moving forward? Absolutely. You mentioned Joe Kennedy. Kennedy, a familiar last yeah. name uh, up here on Capitol Hill. Uh, probably no accident. Uh, that probably helped in that with that selection. Uh, and we know that when he speaks in Massachusetts, he will be speaking in front of an audience. You know, sometimes these response videos almost look like hostage videos in a room just speaking to camera. But uh, uh, when Joe Kennedy speaks, he'll be speaking to a room of about 100 people, we, we think. And Joe Kennedy's uh, big on social media. He was talking about trying to Snapchat as uh, parts of what he's doing. And he was just tweeting out a few minutes ago to his thousands of followers. Um, one of his uh, uh, fans tweeted that somewhere in Fall, Fall River, Massachusetts Joe Kennedy is, is getting nervous because the president's running pretty long and we all know the Marco Rubio hydration question Absolutely. of how that went so badly for him and Joe Kennedy tweeted no kidding so right. he's in on the joke <laughs> I mean he's he told the Washington Post this week that he's just trying basically you know to get through this experience uh, he's at kind of a low bar in a very humorous way get through this experience right. without any hydration uh, errors and, uh, and and major faux pas he's 37 years old relatively uh, young so yeah. uh, he's got two children um, and he is is the uh, great-grandchild of Robert F. Kennedy Jr., I believe. So the president about to leave the chamber. We're here in Statuary Hall, just a few feet away from where the president uh, is about to leave. And so there's a ton of cameras right behind us. If you hear a lot of clicking, that's because the cameras are eager to catch the shot of President Trump leaving his very first State of the Union address. Yeah. And Libby, what I'm going to be watching in the coming days here on Capitol Hill is how much uh, the president's bipartisan outreach really sticks. You know, we've heard this before from the president that he wants to work across the aisle, uh, but it hasn't really been backed up by a lot of action in the past. So uh, it'll be interesting to hear uh, what members think of uh, tonight's offering from the president. And we saw standing ovations, bipartisan standing ovations, Jordan, as the president introduced these American heroes, uh, people who had come to the rescue of others during the floods, during the fires, uh, talking about Marines who've been Here's successful uh, and in incredibly valiant. But we did not see a lot of standing ovations for aspects of President Trump's plan itself. And I did not see a lot of bipartisan support, even when the president talked about low unemployment numbers for African Americans. We saw African American Democratic House members just sitting stony faced Absolutely. and not reacting. It's important to dig into those numbers a little bit. Even though unemployment is down for African Americans, that's a trend that started under President Obama, and a lot of Democrats give him credit for that. And it's still so much higher than what white Americans experience. Right. So there, you know, even that couldn't get uh, Democrats by on, on board by any means. Right. And as far as tone with the president tonight, it was very patriotic. It was very uplifting. And I really think he sort of started moving into this American moment that he was talking about. It went beyond making America great, and he said. We are making America great towards the end of his speech. And I thought, well, it'll be interesting to see if that tone sticks around. If he and keeps yet it up. the things he was talking about were not necessarily bipartisan in exactly. nature in terms of his policy proposals and what he considers to be his accomplishments so far. If you see people walking behind us, that's because we're in Statuary Hall. It's right next to the House chamber where the president just gave his speech. And so we're seeing House members, Senate members come through, talking to reporters. We're getting their two cents. And we will be talking to some members of the Senate in just a little while after we hear from Congressman Kennedy to hear what they thought of this speech and uh, and and if they had the uh, the the reaction that the president wanted right. them to have tonight. And let's not forget, Joe Kennedy will not be the only Democratic response tonight. We mentioned this earlier. Bernie Sanders will be giving his own response. He did the same thing last year when the president ad addressed a joint session of Congress. We'll also see a response from the Democrats uh, in Spanish. Um, I think there's about five. Maxine of them Waters total. is yeah. doing one on BET. Um, of course, rose to a lot of national fame with the reclaiming my time mm -hmm. uh, footage that really went viral. So we are hearing from different quarters of the Democratic establishment, but Joe Kennedy is the official right. representative. The of, one we will uh, bring you right here absolutely. in just a few minutes. And you know, there were a lot of optics on display tonight. We did see some women, especially on the Democratic side of the aisle, wearing all black, maybe with a, a flare of color or a scarf or something. That was for Me Too, to support that Me Too and Time's Up m movement. 
We also saw some purple ribbons we did. in the chamber on both sides, which is to help support the fight against opioid addiction. And then some members of the Congressional Black Caucus were wearing kinte cloth, traditional African clothing, um, so that they could show their support for African countries and, and nations, uh, places like Haiti, after the president's right. uh, uh, offensive remarks about African nations a couple of weeks ago. You mentioned the purple ribbons for op opioids, and I think that is uh, a part of the president's speech that will get more attention maybe as time goes on, because that is an issue that affects every single member of Congress in their home states. Uh, there are hearings on the Hill regularly about opioids, and I would expect in the year ahead that, that really, that's an issue that really rises to the top. And we heard members of Congress saying that they wanted to hear from President Trump on that tonight. The real question, though, is funding and investment yeah. and, and how far that goes. I want to remind you that we're going to go to Falls, Fall River, Massachusetts, in just a moment or two to hear from Congressman Joe Kenney and the Democratic response. But stick us with us on the other end, because we'll talk to senators right here in staff hall or statuary hall to get their grade of President Trump's speech tonight. Right, their initial reaction, right, post a little post-game analysis. Right? Absolutely. And members of Congress brought their own guests tonight, so we'll talk a little bit about what those guests represented. A lot of dreamers were here, mm -hmm. members of the military were here. Also, uh, Senator Casey, for example, of Pennsylvania brought the mom of some Medicaid recipients right. to show that there are working parents who are doing their best to benefit from that program, making a political statement with that choice. The other thing we'll be watching, when does the president tweet next, right? Absolutely. Will that, will that uh, overstep uh, his speech tonight if he starts tweeting in the morning? I think that's a real concern. And if he does start tweeting, will it be in that same tone of American pride, or will right. it be in the tone of partisanship and uh, and more of the divisive issues? Right, exactly. Um, and like we mentioned, he'll be addressing the Republican caucus later this week to potentially continue this message, maybe Maybe lay out some more of his legislative agenda. Um, we'll see that in the coming days as well. And yet we don't expect him to take this on the road. Democrats see that as an opportunity where they can get in. Let's go now to Fall River, Massachusetts, and Congressman Joe Kennedy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is an absolute privilege to join you all tonight. We are here in Fall River, Massachusetts, a proud American city. An American city built by immigrants. From textiles to robots, this is a place that knows how to make great things. The students who are with us here this evening in the auto tech program at Diamond Regional Technical School carry on that rich legacy. Like many American hometowns, Fall River has faced its share of storms. But the people here are tough. They fight for each other. They pull for their city. It is a fitting place to gather as our nation reflects on the state of our union. This is a difficult task. Many have spent the last year anxious, angry, afraid. We all feel the fractured fault lines across our country. We hear the voices of Americans who are forgotten and feel forsaken. We see an economy that makes stocks soar, investor portfolios bulge, and corporate profits climb, but fails to give workers their fair share of the reward. A government that struggles to keep itself open, Russia, knee-deep in our democracy. An all-out war on environmental protection. A Justice Department rolling back civil rights by the day. Hatred and supremacy proudly marching in our streets. Bullets tearing through our classrooms, concerts, and congregations targeting our safest, sacred places. 
and this nagging, sinking feeling, no matter your political beliefs, that this is not right. This is not who we are. Folks, it would, it would be easy to dismiss this past year as chaos, partisanship as politics. But it's far, far bigger than that. This administration isn't just targeting the laws that protect us. They're targeting the very idea that we are all worthy of protection. For them, dignity isn't something you're born with but something you measure by your net worth, your celebrity, your headlines, your crowd size. Not to mention the gender of your spouse, the country of your birth, the color of your skin, the God of your prayers. Their record is a rebuke to our highest American ideal, the belief that we are all worthy, that we are all equal, that we all count. In the eyes of our law and our leaders, our God and our government, that is the American promise. Today, ladies and gentlemen, today, that promise is being broken by an administration that callously appraises our worthiness and decides who makes the cut and who can be bargained away. They're turning American life into a zero-sum game where for one to win, another must lose, where we can guarantee America's safety if we slash our safety net where we can extend health care in Mississippi if we gut it in Massachusetts. We can cut taxes for corporations today if we raise them on families tomorrow. Where we can take care of sick kids if we sacrifice dreamers. We are bombarded with one false choice after another. Coal miners or single moms? Rural communities or inner cities? The coast or the heartland? as if the mechanic in Pittsburgh, a teacher in Tulsa, and a daycare worker in Birmingham are bitter rivals, rather than mutual casualties of a system forcefully rigged towards those at the top. As if the parent who lies awake terrified that their transgender son or daughter will be beaten and bullied at school is any more or less legitimate than a parent whose heart is shattered by a daughter in the grips of an opioid addiction. So here is the, is the answer that Democrats offer tonight. We choose both. We fight, we fight for both, because the greatest, strongest, richest nation in the world should not have to leave anyone behind. We choose, we choose a better deal for all who call our country home. We choose a living wage and a paid leave and affordable childcare your family needs to survive. We choose pensions that are solvent, trade packs that are fair, roads and bridges that won't rust away, a good education that you can afford. We choose a healthcare system that offers you mercy, whether you suffer from cancer or depression or addiction. We choose an economy strong enough to boast record stock prices 
and brave enough to admit that top CEOs making 300 times their average worker is not right. We choose Fault River. We choose the thousands of American communities whose roads aren't paved with power or privilege, but with an honest effort, with good faith, and the resolve to build something better for your kids. That, that is our story. It began the day our founding fathers and mothers set sail for a new world, fleeing oppression and intolerance. It continued with every word of our independence, the audacity to, to declare that all men are created equal, an imperfect promise for a nation struggling to become a more perfect union. It grew with every suffragette step, every freedom rider's voice, and with every weary soul we welcomed to our shores. And to all the dreamers out there watching tonight, let me be absolutely clear. Ustedes son parte de nuestra historia. Vamos a luchar. Vamos a luchar por ustedes. Y no, nos vamos a alejar. You are part of our story. We will fight for you, and we will not walk away. America, we carry that story on our shoulders. You swarmed Washington last year to ensure that no parent has to worry if they can afford to save their child's life. You proudly marched together last weekend, thousands deep, on the streets of Las Vegas and Philadelphia and Nashville. You sat high atop your mom's shoulders and held a sign that read, build a wall and my generation will tear it down. You bravely say, me too. You steadfastly say, black lives matter. You wade through floodwaters, battle hurricanes, brave wildfires and mudslides to save a stranger. You battle your own quiet battles every single day. You drag your weary bodies to that extra shift so that your families won't feel the sting of scarcity. You leave loved ones at home to defend our country overseas, or patrol our neighborhoods at night. You serve, you rescue, you help, you heal. That, more than any law or leader, debate or disagreement, that is what drives us towards progress. Bullies may land a punch, they may leave a mark, but they have never, not once, in the history of our United States, managed to match the strength and spirit of a people united in defense of their future. Politicians. <laughs> Politicians can be cheered for the promises they make. Our country will be judged by the promises we keep. That is the measure of our character. That is who we are. Out of many, one. Ladies and gentlemen, have faith. Have faith. The state of our union 
is hopeful, resilient, and enduring. God bless you. God bless your families. And may God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Congressman Joe Kennedy Demo delivering the Democratic response from Fall River, Massachusetts. I'm Libby Casey with my colleague Jordan Frazier at The Washington Post. And we're joined now by Senator Maisie Hirono of Aloha. Hawaii, a Democrat. Aloha. Thank you so much for Thank talking you. with us. Senator, what was your reaction to President Trump's speech tonight? Give us your initial takeaways. Well, tonight we got teleprompter Trump, where he tried to show himself as a caring, compassionate human being. Uh, it, but it belied the fact that for an entire year he has been neither caring nor compassion, compassionate because he eliminated the DACA program, endangering 800,000 DACA participants. He's gone after Muslims. He's gone after judges who don't agree with him. He's fired Comey. He tried to fire Mueller. Uh, the list goes on. So while he tried to portray himself as a regular, normal human being, in, in my view, uh, it remains to be seen how he'll be tomorrow and whether his priorities really will reflect uh, this compassionate side of him, which I have yet to see. We heard the president try to reach out in a bipartisan way and say he wants to work across the aisle. Do you believe him? It remains to be seen. So, so much of what he says uh, really exemplifies his intentions, such as with the Muslim ban. And um, I pay attention to his tweets because they reflect his intent. Uh, and so he says certain things, it remains to be seen, because this is a president who lies every single day. Hmm. Is there strong words after a State of the Union speech? Well, uh, you know, I wish that I wish that uh, I could feel reassured that he's going to change as a human being. But everybody agrees that you you don't get to be age 70 and suddenly change your stripes. I would like for that to happen for the good of our country. Were there moments that you cheered tonight, that you applauded, that you felt like I can get behind this? When he talked about infrastructure, because that's something that we've all been wanting to work on for a long, long time, and when you, when you spend money on infrastructure, you create jobs and you get lasting results. So that's something that we shall see. But you know, when he rolled out his infrastructure plan, that took all of five, five minutes at the White House, and then he went on to rail about something else. So if he can stay the course on infrastructure, that could be something that we could support. Clearly what's ahead, though, is the whole immigration issue. And when he talks about chain migration, I don't think he even knows what he's talking about. He often refers to someone who came in and brought 23 other people. That is an out-and-out -out lie. And I asked the Secretary of Homeland Security, how does that even happen? She didn't know, because it's a lie. There you go. One of the other things we heard the president say is that he plans to keep Guantanamo Bay open and yes. open the door to possibly even adding more detainees there. What's your reaction to that proposal? Well, as he talks about pride in eliminating ISIS, at least their, their, um, uh, their uh, uh, how should I say, their territorial, you know, gains. Um, we know that Guantanamo is used as a symbol of, of U.S. oppression, and it has been used to basically recruit um, terrorists. So there's that. And basically, I think that he, he um, particularly doesn't want to close Guantanamo because he's somebody who thinks that we should engage in enhanced interrogation techniques. And anything that Barack Obama wants, he's, he's very much against. Senator Ob he should spend more time thinking about what he really, you know, what the results of what he said. So it's like a counter, a counter response to what he's, President Obama had done before. He's still responding to President Obama in so many ways. And, uh, you know, the one positive I thought tonight was that perhaps we have a shot at uh, infrastructure. Senator, obviously North Korea is a country that you watch closely as someone yes. who lives in Hawaii, and we saw that harrowing false alert go yes. out a couple of weeks ago. That really terrified a lot of Hawaiians. Um, we're hearing some news about that today, that the person who sent that out did think there was a legitimate threat. Uh, are uh, you— No, I don't think that's right, because uh, everyone acknowledges that it was a, a human error that— Absolutely, it was human error, yes. but the human error wasn't just like the accidental push of a button. The reporting shows that the, the person who sent the alert out thought there was a problem initially. So when you think about the president's... That is not... No, he okay, did not think that, that there was me. a problem. You know, it was human error. He pressed the wrong button. Okay. I think that is very clear. But the 38 minutes of fear that the people in Hawaii felt, that was real. 
because they didn't know what was really happening and it took way too long for the all clear or the false alarm to information to get out. But and, and how do you right. think about North Korea as someone who has to watch this? The president talked about that a lot tonight, brought the family of Otto Warmbier here, brought a survivor of, uh, of someone who fled from North Korea here tonight. As it turns out that in the Armed Services Committee today, on which I serve, we had three experts on Asia, including North Korea and Korea. And one of them is Admiral De uh, Dennis Blair, who I knew. He was the Pacific commander when I was uh, lieutenant governor. And he said that North Korea is not an imminent threat. And I said imminent threat, meaning that they are going to send missiles to, a, to the United States. He said, look, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing a number of things. But this whole idea of we're going to either do a military response or, or diplomacy, that is a false bi uh, bilateral or bi binary choice that we should be doing a number of other things. And that's what our country is not doing. Senator First of all, they all agreed that we should have an ambassador to South Korea, who we don't have. And the name that the White House floated, they're pulling back. Why? Because he doesn't agree with their, uh, what is it, bloody nose or whatever tactic. So this is yet another example of this administration that doesn't want to hear all different perspectives. They want, yes, people around them, and that's not good for national security or our, the strength of our alliances. And that position remains unfilled. Before we let you go, I want to point out the pins yes. and, and what you're wearing. You're wearing black black tonight uh, in support of the Me Too movement. Yes. Can you just show our audience what you're yes. wearing? So I have a uh, pin that is in support of the, the more funding mm -hmm. and support for um, opioid crisis. I have the, uh, what Time's is it, up. this other bit? Time's up, Time's yes. Up. yes. Can't read upside down. And then very importantly, this is my uh, break the glass ceiling pin that was designed by a Japanese artist living in California quite a while ago. And I think it's appropriate because women are not there yet. Right. Well, Senator Hirono, thank you so thank much you for your time much. tonight. Thank Aloha. you. Thank you. We appreciate Aloha. that. So Senator Maisie Hirono, of course, Democrat of Hawaii. We will let her go. And, and uh, will... next up is talking to a Republican. Yeah, absolutely. We'll get the Republican perspective here. Senator Cory Gardner of Colorado is joining us. It's great thank to you, see you, Senator. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you very much. So much thank you. Uh, your initial reaction to the president's speech tonight? Well, I think it started off with a very good tone in terms of bipartisanship. He talked about the fact that there's never been a better time to live the American dream. I think that's something that we all need to be reminded of after a very divisive year. You, you're focused a lot on the 2018 election. Right. Was his message tonight something that will help you in that quest? Uh, I think the message is about the successes that we've had the past year, the opportunities we have going ahead. Uh, the fact that he, the, the tax cuts have re resulted in hundreds of billions of dollars in new investments in this country, people bringing their dollars back from overseas into the United States, the auto manufacturers that are relocating back into the United States. That means economic opportunity. That means growing wages. That means salary increases. That means better jobs. And that's what people care about as, as we also a very big picture approach. Can that happen? So the president tonight laid out again the four things that he wants to talk about when it comes to immigration. I think that's something that we have uh, addressed in a bipartisan fashion in the Senate. We'll continue to. He also talked about the need for cooperation, compromise, and negotiation in this uh, discussion. That's so is what this we have a starting point? I think it's, again, it continues to be a starting point, knowing that that's the Senate, the House, with bipartisan support. If we do that, we can get this signed and we can address one of the most perplexing challenges that this this uh, this Congress has ever seen. And Senator, one of the other things the president talked about tonight was keeping Guantanamo Bay open and right. potentially adding deta detainees there. What, what do you think of that? Uh, Guantanamo is tailor-made for terrorists. I've long opposed the transfer of Guantanamo detainees back into the United States. Uh, there have been attempts over the past uh, to try to bring them to Colorado. I strongly objected to that. Uh, these are terrorists. They deserve Guantanamo Bay. They belong in Guantanamo Bay. And I commend the president for making sure they stay in Guantanamo Bay. Infrastructure spending, Democrats are interested in what the president had to offer. Right. What is your perspective on that? I, I hope that we can come together on a strong infrastructure package. Uh, the roads in Colorado are incredibly congested. We've had a million people move there in the past decade, 100,000 move there every year. We need to make sure that we have an infrastructure package that can actually pass. A lot of detail needs to be worked out. He talked about $1.5 trillion in money uh, matched by, it sounded like another $1.5 trillion. So a lot of detail that we have to get. But I hope that Republicans, Democrats come, can come together on something as important as our nation's infrastructure. Can there's you? Can yeah, you yeah, we can. There's a, there's a lot on your guys' plate. You guys <laughs> yeah, got a lot yeah, to do. I think this is one of the most important issues that we can address, and this is something this president has talked about from the time on the campaign trail to now, and it's something that I think we can actually do. 
Great. The president is not taking his plan on the road in quite the yeah. same way that we've seen past administrations right. do. Is that a missed opportunity? Uh, I think this president knows how to go on the road. He likes to go on the road. I don't think there's a missed opportunity. Uh, I think he will continue to send his message out. And as we all know, this president has a very unique way of getting his message out uh, in perhaps ways that none of us uh, have ever thought of. Does it make you nervous? <laughs> well, look, uh, I, th what the president does, I think, to get his message out has worked for him. Uh, but I think what we can do together is make sure that we now turn to the bipartisan opportunities he laid out and get them across the finish line in Congress. The, the president also said tonight that this is a new American moment that we're living in. Do, do you agree with that sentiment? You know, I think if you look at where we are right now, we've, we've had great success in the war on terror. Uh, we have a tax bill that is driving this economy to historic lows in unemployment. Uh, so this really is an opportunity for this country uh, to not settle again for second place. It seems like for far too long this country has had people who want to settle for second place. We don't have to do that. We shouldn't do that. And I think what tonight you heard was the opportunity of this American exceptionalism to get back on top. Senator, I do want to mention your purple ribbon yes, there. Tell yes. us about that. Yeah, so the purple ribbon is about addiction. It's about the, the president talked about it tonight, opiate abuse, addictions that have taken far too many lives across this country. We've passed bipartisan legislation, the Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act. We have to do more to make sure that we continue to stop this scourge of the epidemic. Great. Thank you so Thanks, much. Senator Senator Gardner, Gardner, yeah. Thanks very much. I appreciate, appreciate it. it. So we'll let Senator Gardner go. He's probably got more interviews to do tonight because people are I obviously roaming it. statuary yeah, looking hall, around the room here, talking I to the it. press. Uh, but obviously, Senator Gardner, Republican of Colorado, not surprising to hear, Jordan, that he supported this speech. Right. But he is someone, as you pointed out, who is very focused on the 2018 election. Yeah, he is the chairman of the Republican Senatorial Campaign Committee, who kind of is in charge of getting Republican senators elected to the chamber. And so the president's messaging is going to be so important come November of this year uh, when people go to the ballot box. So this speech tonight, uh, he was definitely paying close attention to. And I want to remind people that uh, the president did talk about the American dream. And as he laid out the, the State of the Union, he talked about it being strong because of Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a message that a lot of Republicans are happy to hear because it takes the focus off of the president a little right. bit and turns it to some of the ideals that they hold. Right. At least for tonight. We'll see if that right. holds up for sure. And I, we should mention in between before we, we spoke with our guests, we saw Congressman Joe Kennedy give the Democratic response. And uh, what I was struck with so much in uh, in his speech was how campaign-like it looked. Oh, my looked. gosh, yeah. I, I mean, that looked like straight out of yeah. New Hampshire or Iowa. Yeah. Um, so there's, it's hard not to think uh, maybe a future presidential contender uh, in Congressman Kennedy eventually somewhere down the road. And we did get the sense from Democratic leadership, such as leader Nancy Pelosi, that the idea was not to take someone who has sort of thrown their name in the of which in there the are many in for for uh, for the next election for 2020 uh, but obviously Congressman Kennedy a rising star so we'll certainly see where he ends up next uh, and uh, and what happens we've yeah. got another guest ready to join us one to of give our all-star reporters Hello. Bob Costa of the Washington Post How joining us now thanks for joining us good to be here uh, all right so give us your big takeaways yeah, what's your takeaway well, I think the most important passage policy-wise was what the president said on immigration. The Democrats did not seem to applaud much of his, his uh, statement. He seemed to make an overture in offering a pathway to citizenship, but so many other parts of his proposal, the changes to legal immigration, the wall, they just remain a non-starter for most Democrats. And that's the most urgent issue right now for this Congress. How do they come up with some kind of immigration agreement between now and February the 8th? Did tonight change anything? No, actually, you just filed a story, I don't know when it will publish, about how it really didn't change much because Congress remains gridlocked. Uh, the president called this a new American moment, uh, but the reality is inside of the Senate, inside of the House, even though they're controlled by Republicans, there are many divisions. Most lawmakers tell me the tax bill that now is the tax law likely will be the biggest accomplishment of this Congress. Not much going to happen this year. Too many tensions about the Russia investigation, the midterm elections. It's not the environment uh, to have some kind of another big effort. Plus, President Trump has seen some of his political capital fall away because of the way he's treated certain members and that because of his statements and his public reputation. You know, I would hear this from people outside the Beltway when President Obama would give a speech like this, and I'm sure we'll hear it. Uh, they would say to me, how can this not move the needle? I was inspired by the speech. I, I, I heard about American heroes, and, and you guys inside the Beltway are like, nothing has changed. Does the president get a public bump from the tone he took tonight and the way that he tried to set an inclusive table for Americans? He may, but I'm hesitant to say that he will, only because in this American period, the presidency is a day-to-day, moment-by-moment endeavor, and 
tomorrow morning he could tweet something about Robert Mueller's probe, and a lot of the reviews from tonight will largely be forgotten. Presidential set pieces like the State of the Union used in the presidency, and a president would move from event to event, stage to event, Bill Clinton. They didn't have this extemporaneous style in the presidency that President Trump has. And for some reason, it does help him and because it keeps him ubiquitous in the culture. But there is a cost in that when there are major mo traditional moments like tonight, not everyone's saying, ah, this really signifies where the presidency stands, because it really doesn't in this day and age. For the rest of the week, the Republican caucus will be huddled in West Virginia. They're, they will hear from Vice President Pence. What do you expect to come um, from the next couple of days of them gathering together? They're going to be at the Greenbrier, so lucky them, yeah. in West Virginia, beautiful, wild, wonderful West Virginia. They're, they're going to have to figure out some midterm strategy. This isn't a policy meeting, really. They're going to talk through an immigration policy. They'll talk through a spending bill. But when I talk to lawmakers today here at the Capitol, Republicans, the House members, they're worried about getting reelected. They see a possible Democratic wave. They want some reassurance in the White House. The money will be there. The strategy will be there. Okay, what do Democrats gain from tonight? What do they lose from tonight? And what do you expect to see from them in the coming days? I mean, they have no choice to make on immigration. If they don't want to come to the table on immigration, there's going to be probably another shutdown on February 8th. Will there be another shutdown on February 8th? <laughs> Tell the Washington Post. Yeah, we're going to bring you in. Yeah, come on over. It was great to see you, Robert. Robert Costa. Thanks, Robert Costa. Robert Robert Costa. Robert Costa. Robert Costa. Robert Costa. Senator Jeff Flake of Arizona joins us now. Senator Flake, it's great to see you. Uh, your initial reaction to the speech tonight. You know, that was a long speech, so we got about uh, a little of everything. Yeah. Some uplifting moments, certainly referring to people in the gallery. That's uh, it's always, you know, unifying. Um, then some, not so much. Uh, some of the discussion on immigration uh, could have been a little more positive, I think. Yeah, so you, you, the president laid out very, right. very number by number his four pillars. Right. Is, does that get through Congress? Well, uh, certainly the kind of the first two numbers, uh, 1.8 million mm -hmm. in terms of those who would be given a path to citizenship. That's very positive um, in exchange for border patrol or border uh, security measures. That is something that everybody, I think, can live with and understands. So those two pillars, fine. Once you get into diversity visa and chain migration, then you have to say, chain migration, how does that affect legal immigration in the future? We need more legal immigration, not less. And if you just do chain migration alone and, and, and have the fix that they've kind of talked about there, that would lead to maybe a, a cut in half of our legal immigration. We can't have that. So there, those things are going to be negotiated, those last two items. Speaking with the topic of immigration, you know, we saw one of your colleagues over on the House side, Congressman Paul Gosar, right. tweeting out uh, that he was proud to say he had talked to the reached out to the attorney right. general, reached out to Capitol Police and encouraged them to arrest anyone who didn't essentially have proper documentation uh, here. Obviously, an attempt to get dreamers sort right. of snared, although dreamers do have right, exactly. the legal that, ability that, to be here. You responded to that yeah. on Twitter. What does that well, say about the tone here? I, I, I think it's unfortunate, uh, too. He was obviously referring to the dreamers. The dreamers have legal status here, those who have registered for DACA. They have legal status. They're not illegal. Uh, they have documents. And uh, so I, I just thought that was unfortunate. Senator, you have been no, you've been a noted critic of the president. Uh, you gave a, that floor speech that got a lot of attention. Right. Did anything tonight change your mind in any way? Uh, you know, he's the president. I respect that. I'll work with him when I can and oppose him when I must. And uh, so, I mean, people read too much into State of the Union addresses in terms of their impact overall. They're usually forgotten pretty quickly. It depends on what you do before and after. Right. And, uh, you know, the thing we need now is bipartisanship. Uh, I think we're so used to reconciliation where we did tax reform and health care reform just with, you know, one party trying to push the agenda. We're done with reconciliation. Everything now is going to be 60 votes in the Senate especially immigration. So I think the more the president can have a unifying message and not refer to dreamers like tonight as you know, referred to them coming across the border, uh, they, they refer to them as illegal aliens, uh, kind of like the Gosar approach. And that's not helpful. Uh, we recognize that they were innocent, innocent uh, in this whole thing. It's their parents uh, who brought them across. So 
I think that uh, a more unifying message on immigration and other things, infrastructure, uh, would be nice as well. Do you have hope that that'll happen from the I president? do, I do. And, and frankly, I've said all along that I think the president's instincts on the DACA uh, problem are better than the advice that he gets. And, and every once in a while, he'll make a statement that you think, man, he's right on. And then he'll kind of be pulled back um, into a different position that, that appeals more to the base. And, you know, in, in order to get something passed with a bipartisan majority, you've got to at some point say, all right, I know the base wants this, but we can't have that. We've got to go broader. Do so. you want to see him be hands off in this process from here on out? Or you talked about the role and the influence he can have to encourage dialogue. Well, if he can have a positive impact, and I frankly think what he did on uh, last Friday was positive. Uh, to put out the 1.5 or 1.8 uh, figure, that was positive. Uh, but going forward, uh, I think he's going to have to recognize those last two pillars are going to require a lot of negotiation. It's not just, uh, you know, hey, get rid of their diversity visa. You can get rid of the diversity visa. We did that in the so-called Gang of Eight bill, but we reallocated those visas to other purposes. If you do chain migration, we did a lot of that in the Gang of Eight bill, too, but we reallocated those visas. And so if he's willing to do that, then I think we're off to a good start. All right, well, we will see. Uh, Senator Jeff Flake, right. Republican of Arizona, thanks, thanks very much. Thanks for me on. Thanks. Thanks for talking with us. All right, well, Libby, what a night. Yeah. A lot of reaction. We Reaction will continue to pour in throughout the night and into the morning, I'm sure. Absolutely, and we'll all be watching, of course, to see what President Trump highlights uh, from this speech. Will we see uh, sort of a more regulated Twitter response and social media response where he's tweeting out some of the highlights of his speech, some of the moments his team is especially proud of, or will we start to see a reaction from him that hits a tone that people like Senator Flake and Senator right. Hirono were concerned about? Right, and we talked about it all evening. He's not traveling to sell any of these plans, so how will he sell it? You know, will it be on Twitter? Will it be through surrogates here on the Hill? We'll, we'll have to wait and see. Absolutely. And uh, one other thing to think about over the next few days is how Republicans can come together, what reaction they put out to these immigration proposals, since that was really the most specific part Absolutely. of the speech tonight, these four pillars. What will Democrats react with, and can there be some negotiation in advance of this February 8th deadline, which you'll be tracking so Absolutely. closely here in the And hill. I think Jeff Flake laid it out perfectly, that point one and point two are different, very different from point three and four. But we'll be here watching it all, for sure. I'm so, Libby Casey. And I'm Jordan Frazier from here in Statuary Hall. Thanks very much for watching. Thanks so much.